Kind of an uneventful day one at the winter meetings for the Baltimore Orioles, but we still got plenty to talk about because while the Orioles go after an ace, hopefully this offseason, they've already got one of their own maybe on the roster. How did Kyle Bradish get this good? We'll talk about it and review his season coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Tuesday, December 5th, 2023, and welcome back into the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we continue our Orioles 2023 season player review series as we will take a look at Kyle Bradish and Mike Bauman on today's episode. Talk about how Bradish got this good, ending up being fifth in AL Cy Young voting and having the best Orioles starting pitcher season since Mike Mussina. How did he get to this point and what can he do moving forward? And then we'll talk a bit about Mike Bauman as well. You know, he got moved to the bullpen, started off the season incredibly well, but then finished the year struggling and in AAA and off the playoff roster. And we'll chat about what he has to do to get back in the good graces of the O's bullpen in 2020. That is all coming up here with Vivek Shukla, who you may have seen throughout Orioles social media, makes multiple appearances on the On the Verge podcast, and uh, he is very knowledgeable about the Orioles and specifically about Kyle Bradish. He's been someone on the internet along with me that has been beating that Kyle Bradish drum really since he came over in the Dylan Bundy trade with the Angels a few years back, and now we're kind of reaping the rewards of that Kyle Bradish deal. So I have Vivek on to talk about Bradish's season and discuss Mike Bauman as well, and that's coming up right now. All right, so we welcome Vivek Shukla into the podcast for the first time. You have probably seen him many places around the Orioles internet and uh, previously has appeared a few times on the On The Verge podcast. Always have those co-hosts on this show, and I thought, well, let's have Vivek on as well because he has kind of been, along with me and a few others, the uh, leaders of the Kyle Bradish hype train over the last few years. And uh, we got to talk about Kyle Bradish's season today. But Vivek, first of all, thank you so much for joining the pod for the first time. Awesome. No, thank you so much. We have uh, fellow Bradish heads and uh, it's amazing where we are now considering <laughs> the trade that happened four years ago and how much us and the rest of the community uh, really loving what he has uh, going for him moving forward. Yeah, so we want to get into this season and I feel like of all these player season reviews you know the Gunnar Henderson one was was great I mean that was it was expected for him to be good but he won rookie of the year and had an outstanding season but I think in terms of how right I feel and also how good I feel about this player going forward this might be might have been the one when I put together the schedule that I'm most excited for and that is Kyle Bradish 27 year old right-hander who makes 30 starts for the Orioles this year 168 and two-thirds innings 283 ERA 25 percent strikeout rate seven percent walk rate and he finishes fifth in AL Cy Young voting. So you pull it all together. Vivek, when you look back on his 2023 season, which will be known as the breakout 2023 season for Kyle Bradish, what do you think the kind of biggest memory, the, the, the number one thing you'll remember from the 2023 campaign for Bradish? Yeah, I think what I'll, what I'll mostly remember is, uh, and again, we, we can probably go into the analytic part about it, how the sinker move, the sinker usage increased, more sliders moving away from the fastball. But I'll remember the fact that every single month after that Boston start, he was just consistent sub three ERAs going through. He found the right pitch, picks, uh, pitch mixes and a few starts obviously come in mind. The one where he's against the Nationals and gets eight innings. I love how he also goes against the Astros all the time, and still to this day, in three starts, hasn't allowed a run against them. But um, I, I think I'll just remember the fact that it felt like every single time Bradish went up there, you had a chance to win, and he was able to fi- he was able to figure it out. He was limiting some of the damage that was being done. Uh, He was making adjustments in game, even if there was a runner on first and second. We even saw a lot of that, even if he got into some trouble in the playoff game. So uh, this is exactly kind of lining in with your prediction that, yeah, he is our opening day starter. No questions asked coming into 2024. And 
to put together the best season in 30 years for a starter since Musina, I mean, you couldn't have asked for more after that Dylan Bundy trade. So it's it's really heartwarming because yes, that's an Orioles starter. Yeah. Yeah. And and an Orioles starter that while he was not drafted by Baltimore, was here fairly quickly after he was drafted by the Angels and was I, I think everyone would agree he was developed by the Orioles. He was not really almost 100%. at all developed by the angels. Yeah. He was developed pretty much fully in the minors, in the majors by the Orioles to see him come up, take his hits early last year, figure yep. it out down the stretch and improve in the off season. I think what I'm going to take away in my biggest memory, and this might be the most self-serving thing I ever say as host of the Locked on <laughs> Orioles podcast, but I felt like I knew ball more than ever before watching Kyle Bradish this year, because this for those of you who listened and watched this podcast last year, really, you know, down the stretch, but even before down the stretch, when he was having those, like that start in St. Louis early last year, when he struck out 12 and you were like, this is the guy. And then he had three in a row, bad ones. And he went on the injured list and, you know, he's kind of shaky in, in June and July. And I'm just getting on this podcast every time he pitches and yelling, Less fastballs, more sliders. Please, 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 please. We need more breaking balls. I'm like, you don't have to go full Lance McCullers, but you got to start moving that direction because that is how good those breaking balls were. And you talked about it. I mean, let's get into it. What he did with the pitch mix. 31% sliders this year, which made it his number one most used pitch. Now, it was his number two pitch last year, which was great, but he clearly needed to move that pitch to number one. It was more sinkers, less four seamers. We'll get into how that change might need to, Keep going, going Keep into going. next year. <laughs> yeah, but but the slider was unbelievable. 168 opponent average, 36% whiff rate, under a 300 slugging percentage against it. And you look at how he changed that pitch mix. He saw it have a great effect. He saw it make him better, and he kept with it. There were rarely starts this year where he even didn't make the slider the number one pitch. Like you'll see starters who have you know a non-fastball as their number one pitch, but sometimes they go out there and they're just using something different. Exactly. You could probably count on one hand this year where the slider was not Bradish's number one most used pitch. And he pitched that to a 283 ERA and 30 starts, meaning he never wavered from that plan. He never wavered from what he knew was going to work for him. And that was what was so good. And I wanted to kind of set you up to talk about the fastballs too, because we knew coming in how good the slider was. And back in the minors, the curveball was the pitch we had heard about. And he throws it a little less now, but it's still very good. But I wanted to kind of tee you up for the fastballs because he found that sinker late in 2022. Him and Dean Kramer kind of added it at the same time. Exactly. And now I think he's starting to learn going into next year, Vivek, that that sinker is just better than his four-seamer. And I think we're going to see that sinker become, I think, his main fastball in 2024. No, exactly. I could, I could definitely see it going in that direction, especially given... I remember and even in a few times if we whether you do Twitter searches and you look at Kyle Bradish's a lot of his profile was being similar to Corbin Burns and we know about Corbin Burns' nasty cutter a lot of his fastball for Kyle Bradish has some natural cut on it which is awesome to see um it's not a bad pitch by any means but at the same time we saw frustrations in 2022 when he'd go heavy fat fastball four seam heavy and then good major league hitters are able to time that up pretty well. So the inclusion of that sinker really helps. Uh, for people who know me, I love ground ball pitchers. So anyone who's got a good sinker or is throwing a sinker at least gives you an opportunity for our defense to generate those double plays or gives our defense a shot to get an out. So I think that really helped him out when he needed a bailout type of pitch outside of the slider. Um, it's amazing to think that, right? Because this transition happened – if you remove Bradish's April and in that injury that he got in Texas, uh, the ERA could have been even lower, but it's already sub three. And it, it makes you kind of think that what is the next step that he can take? Uh, the interview, the confidence from him at, in, before the Texas game was, I've done this before. I've done this in front of fans. It's, I don't think anyone could have expected this level of confidence coming from, yeah, we have we have an ace who's very confident in his ability and uh, even, even to kind of speak a little bit to the breaking balls, which I'm, I'm sure we'll get into. Uh, I think he's the hundredth percentile in, in the run value that he's generating from his breaking balls. And now he's improving that fastball because he's discovered the sinker. So I, I, I'm excited for 
what's to come. So we'll get back to talking about Kyle Bradish and eventually Mike Bauman with Vivek Shukla in just a second. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Jace Medical. Now, what is Jace Medical? They're a company that is there for you when you need it. Their main product, their number one product, is the Jace case. It is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, stuff that could really happen to anyone. And there's a lot of people who might be interested in a Jace case. You can get some for yourself or anyone in your life this holiday season. So visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It'll be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications can be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared. So go to jacemedical.com and use the offer code Locked On to get $20 off your order. Yeah, you look at the fastballs, and he did pretty much by the end of the year, even out the two fastball usage. I mentioned the slider was 31% throughout the year. Four-seamer was 22%. Sinker was 21%. So he mm-hmm. basically got to those pitches where he was kind of interchanging them. But you look at the stats against him. Four-seamer. Opponents hit 366 and slugged 602 against the four-seamer. Sinker, 230 average, about a, a, a two-degree launch angle on average against it. So he's getting a lot of ground balls. Now, I don't want him to go away from the four-seamer because it's still a pitch where he has in the past gone up in the zone and gotten strikeouts with it. But it's not a big swing and miss pitch. It gets hit hard. I think we're definitely going to see the sinker overtake the four-seamer next year. And then there's that curveball. It's 17% of the time it's his number four pitch, and yet 36% whiff rate. That is, it's, It's marginally better than the slider on swing and miss. 142 batting average against that was the breaking ball we heard about in the minors it's now his number two yeah and you mentioned the breaking balls you mentioned the run value among sliders for starters in baseball he was fourth in run value Mm -hmm. among starters for curveballs in baseball he was third and if you look at those two leaderboards the guys ahead of him for sliders are different guys that are ahead of him for curveballs i would argue i want to get your thoughts on this among all starting pitchers in baseball kyle bradish might have the best one, two breaking ball punch in the game, like in the game. Yeah. That is how good those two pitches are. No, absolutely. I, I, it was always that curveball. I think some parallels to even like the same way where I thought he was going to be using more curveball often. I think in some of the starts, we would see him use the four seam, not really too much of the change up and then the sliders, but he would go four seam fastball heavy. And who knows? Maybe it's attributed to. This is how I get pitchers out in the minor leagues. So it's just kind of play in the major leagues. But I'm happy he had those growing pains in 2022. Uh, The curveball is another weapon. And maybe because it's not used as often, it surprises a lot of hitter. Really nice. I mean, you and I have seen it from the high arm slot. And I know we like guys that have the high arm slot. That 12-6 break is so beautiful on his curveball. And then... Even just looking up on Baseball Savant, that that slider, like it's not just like the right to left movement, but it also has a good amount of vertical drop. I mean, I think when you look at uh, the specific breakdown on Baseball Savant, they're both in the red, horizontal and vertical movement. So these hitters are really chasing something that they think is hittable and it just jumps out of the zone. So uh, I think there's a few more that are on the list. I think Charlie Morton also has a pretty good one, or uh, it might be Blake Snell and a few others. But from a one-two punch, slider and curveball, uh, amazing. And I think you and I probably both read that article about Bradish's stuff plus uh, on that slider is exceptional. Um, yeah. yeah. He could have, and it's tough to outdo like some reliever sliders because when you throw a max effort for one inning, it's really tough to outstuff some sliders that are out there from relievers. Like I I get it, but among starters, he's going to be up there. And here's the thing, like these other guys that are on this list for these breaking balls, you mentioned Morton, you mentioned Snell, Kershaw's still up there, you know, despite uh, lost fastball velocity, his breaking balls are still elite. That's why he's still good. These are guys who are on the backswing of their careers right now, like Kyle Bradish has five more years of control in an Orioles uniform. And even if the O's, you know, aren't willing to pay guys and extend guys, you know, he's not ARB eligible until after next year. He's not a free agent until after 2028. Like they have Kyle Bradish if they do nothing for five more seasons. And as we talked about, there's still adjustments he can make with kind of the four seam usage and maybe what, what spots he uses it in and maybe how he deploys the curveball that he can be better than a 30 start season with a two, eight, three ERA. 
And again, if he doesn't get hit in the foot by a line drive, maybe we're looking at 180-something innings instead of about 169 innings on the year, which makes him even more valuable as a number one pitcher for this team. And he deserved what he got at the end of the year, which was that game one playoff start. It wasn't his best start. He only threw four and two thirds. He did scatter seven hits, give up a couple of runs, but he struck out nine Love and he that. walked one against the offense that went on to kind of dominate the playoffs and win the World Series. And he had eight whiffs on 14 swings on his slider, which was just him showing off his number one pitch to the entire baseball world who hadn't seen Kyle Bradish anymore. And this is kind of not, you know, this isn't like a statistical question that I'm asking you to ask. This oh, is yeah. more of like a narrative Orioles question. It's like, Sure. I think at least people who follow the game fairly closely know at this point, the Baltimore Orioles have a homegrown ace right now. And it's kind of wild to think that they have that. And although I love Grayson Rodriguez, that's not the guy we're talking about right now. Okay. I think this is a huge, huge positive on the board for Mike Elias and his staff making that trade. And then the pitching development in the minors and the major leagues, this might be, I would put right now as maybe number one success story of the rebuild so far. And I know it's only been two big league seasons, but for the Orioles to have a guy, I mean, when's the last true number one they had? It might've been Mike Mussina. And to say, this is the Orioles best starting season since Mike Mussina. I think it puts the Orioles for like the national standard and the national baseball mm -hmm. fan on another level. And yes, they do still need to go get a starter this off season, but if Kyle Bradish starts opening day, I'm feeling pretty good about that. 100%. I, I couldn't have said it better. I, you, you think about a guy when I'll never forget when that first <laughs> trade was made. I think it was December 2nd or December 4th because we it was back-to-back -back with the VR trade in 2019. And <laughs> lo and behold, everyone looks at this is the number 21st project, uh, prospect coming from the Angel system because everyone looks up MLB Pipeline. And then it's number 27th prospect according to fan graphs. So right off the top, the other three guys, unfortunately, aren't ranked. And so everyone thinks, looks like the Orioles are looking for quantity versus quality. And so immediately from there, I, you know, uh, shout out to a few people, Chris uh, Resitar on, on, on Facebook or on Twitter, and then Luke Seiler. There was a beautiful post he talked about how the Orioles are probably looking at this quality and this quality, this curveball, his slider. And this is how we can kind of tweak potentially – Luke went on to later work with the Orioles, which is kind of amazing. But you took a guy who had a relief prospect status in the uh, uh, in, in the Angels organization. You brought it over to a point where he was ranked about number seven in fan graphs. So you brought him into an already loaded Orioles system and you raised his value to the point where we can optimize this player like it's. It's not exactly maybe the reverse of like a Jake Arietta in a way where they found the right pitch mix and then they turned him into a Cy Young candidate. I I could not have expected Bradish to have this type of development so quickly, I guess, because even right, he comes over from the trade and then COVID hits. So we don't get to see him. 2021 allows no runs in buoy in three starts. I think he had like 26 Ks in 13.2 innings. And then it's already going to AAA and then ends the year there. So uh, it's amazing that they identified this trait. Like we don't have an affiliate that's in the Angels realm. So we were really looking around and highlighting these traits just from the very get-go. This is, I would have to say, one of the best like development stories. Like... Trades are obviously going to be made to try to bring in prospects in hopes that something does pan out. And we know sometimes trades won't work out, you know, but just this itself happening is such a nice boost. I'm I'm sure Bradish's project or his development has helped change this trajectory uh, for our team. Yeah, and, and he's in a interesting spot because when you hear a guy with five years of control left you're thinking oh you know that's Amazing. that's five prime years <laughs> you don't know that because he is already 27 you know how many yeah. of those years will be prime years but a good chunk of them will be and again still room to get better which i think is the coolest part here i i think he's gonna win a cy young at some point i, I mean he finishes fifth oh, yeah yeah you know you're gonna have some of these guys who are winning these awards 
getting a little bit older. I know Garrett Cole is going to be here for a while and he's just going to continue to have a, amazing seasons. But, right. you know, I love Kevin Gosman. I don't know if he's going to have a season as good as he did this year ever again. He's still going to be really good, but that was an incredible strikeout season that Gosman had for the Blue Jays. And, you know, Sonny Gray, again, he's now in the National League. And also that's probably like the peak of what we're going to get from Sonny Gray from, from his yeah. point on now for yeah. – for him, and I just think at some point he could win that award. And with him and Grayson up top, it's it's fun. Yeah. And again, he's he's an ace moving forward. It's it's fantastic to see. Now, the other pitcher that we're going to talk about on this episode, and I wanted to kind of ask you about this in a little bit about how they were on a similar ish track. I mean, Bauman was an Orioles draft pick, so he was yeah. in the system a little bit longer, but they were both seen as very highly rated pitching prospects behind Grayson and, and DL Hall. But Mike Bauman got finally the thing that I've been calling for kind of similar to Kyle Bradish was I was pretty early on just looking at Mike Bauman and watching him and Bowie and you know see him a little bit in Norfolk and just thinking like I I like you know I, I still like that they're trying out DL Hall's start like I still like it because you never know what could break there but I just saw Mike Bauman and I thought he's gonna end up in the bullpen it's just gonna happen there's a little bit yeah. of command issues the stuff is so good it's gonna play up with the velocity with that hard slider he's gonna be in there Spring training was so weird this year because, remember, they went in and said, hey, we have 12 starting pitching options. Mike Bauman's one of them. It took like 10 days, and they were always like, Mike Bauman's actually a reliever now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it was not even two weeks, I don't think. And they were like, oh, actually, um, we're transitioning him full-time to the bullpen, not just, oh, we're going to stick him there for now. Right. And I think that was the right call, and it was really good early this year. I mean, I had 1-1-5 ERA in about 15 innings in April, and we were like, the O's made the right move. He's looking good. He just kind of tailed off as the season went on. Mm -hmm. Now he made 60 appearances and that's huge, right? If you can cover 65 innings as a big, re big league reliever, who's in the Orioles case, very cost controlled as well. Like you will take that and 65 innings at a three, seven, six ERA with a 22% strikeout rate. You'll take it. 12% walk rate was fairly high for Mike Bauman. And we'll get to that being the issues. But so you look back on Mike Bauman, finally getting Vivek a first full big league season. I know he wasn't up here every single day and he didn't even end up on the playoff roster, but he gets a full season as a reliever. What do you think is the one thing you'll remember or look back on from this first full big league season for big Mike? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that again, Mike Bauman, I still have the images in my mind of that no hitter he threw in Bowie when the last pitch he strikes out Michael A. Taylor on 99. Um, certainly, right. If, if we were in, in a position where we wanted to experiment more, Maybe we would let him go as a starter, but I think all of us know that he's got that great fastball velocity. <laughs> Similar to Bradish, I'll say he pairs up that curveball really well. It's got a nice break to it, and I, I did see you know the curveball usage also increase uh, just throughout the year and whatnot. But I guess what I'll remember about Mike Bauman is that I wish and I hope he's able to consistently deliver. Um, at least find his release point at times because we've seen when he's sporadic and the walks start hurting. But we've also seen games this year. Uh, maybe it was the one where uh, against the Yankees, I think he closed out right after Bradish actually had pitched already uh, a scoreless game. Uh, he himself was up to 99 miles per hour. And we know Mike Bauman's got the velocity. Sometimes he's 95, 96 for some days. But first year in now as a reliever, really had some nice breaking ball values. I think the run value I'm trying to remember uh, from, from the baseball savant was pretty solid for that uh, slider and curve ball. It's the fastball that hurt him the most. And I think definitely I wish he was on that playoff roster and looking in, in retrospect, but he doesn't have any options this year, but he's definitely a candidate in my mind should be on the roster this year because of that, uh, again, ability to come in in big situations. Uh, maybe not the most highest of leverage situations, mm -hmm. but he's a perfect sixth, seventh inning type of guy for me. And that has value. I think he's under five years of control. So I think the best is yet to come because I even think about, can we introduce a sinker for Mike Bauman? Potentially. And I think it's something if they were still trying him out as a starter, he might already have in the arsenal from them. But I think because of the move to the bullpen, because of the velocity he gets from the four seamer, it just doesn't seem like his fastball. It's one of the the classic high velocity, but 
not one of the hoppy fastballs, basically yeah. not nearly as hoppy, you know, as a fastball that you'll see from a lot of pitchers, especially in the Orioles system at the moment. And velocity is great. And when he, you know, he's averaging 96 and a half, 97, and he's up to 99 and that's yeah. great. But when you don't have that jump, hitters are more used to 99 than they used to be 10, 15, 20 years ago. So it plays yeah. a little different. Now the curveball, he threw over half fastballs this year, but the curveball 25% of the time, 192 batting average against 33% Solid. with rate like that yeah. was a good pitch. I'm just so intrigued by a slider because he averages a slider at 92 miles an hour. Ridiculous. It's 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 essentially <laughs> a cutter that just moves more. I mean that's really what the pitch is and it's it's not super high whiff rates. It's up and down. It did have a 672 slug against that slider this year. That is a concerning number certainly yeah. and he did give up some long balls this season in some inopportune times as well. But I just you look at his year and you know he has the great April, he has a horrendous May at a seven five ERA in May after a great April. Mm -hmm. Then he kind of pulls it back together, has a one five ERA in July, then has an ERA of almost six in August. And on August 23rd, they sent him down. He was yeah. in the bullpen all year, gets sent down on the 23rd, comes back on September 16th briefly, and then is sent right back to Norfolk a week later and never came back. Like I believe he was, I think he was at the workouts for the postseason roster but he was one of the right. pitchers that was at the workouts but was not put on the roster and yeah. i actually talked about this on last week an episode with daniel allen tuck and we talked mm -hmm. about cole irvin and how yeah maybe in retrospect you might have put him over jack flaherty you know on the postseason oh, yeah. roster yeah. over brian baker there is that conversation about you know bauman over brian baker but when i think back to the end of the year my trust was so low in mike bauman as a reliever by the end of that season yeah. I actually didn't mind as much him not being on that roster. Now, my take by the end of it, and mostly in retrospect, was Irvin over Flaherty and Fuji over Baker. It kind of wasn't even Bauman at that point yeah. because yeah. I kind of lost trust in him. And again, he's got control, right? He's got team control, I should say. Sometimes control of his pitches is iffy. <laughs> and Vivek, he's one of the guys, and this is more of an eye test thing than, than a data thing. He seems to be, you know, when when pitchers always talk about, you know, there's two different kinds of losing your command. There's losing your command where you're walking a million guys. He does that sometimes. But there's also losing your command where you're in the strike zone and you're not throwing a pitch where you want. He seemed to live accidentally in the middle of the plate a lot. And that seemed to hurt him as well. And I'll kind of look back on just being frustrated in him by the end of the season because we saw how good it could be in the minors, here at the majors, early in the year as a reliever. And I just wanted to kind of finish up on this with Mike Bauman. Like, there yeah. is something still there. I am not in any way giving up on Mike Bauman, but you don't have as much time now on a 100 win team to figure it out. Like, you've got to get yourself right in the offseason. And I know you kind of feel the same that, that something is still in there for him to be, at, at the very least, an impact middle reliever for this team. No, definitely. I mean, we've seen him sponge up more than one inning before when when need be if one of our starters got out in the fifth inning um i think there's definitely a potential there i don't know if i can attribute perhaps the 60 appearances which is a lot to come in it's a different role and if you think about it he's really getting exposed to the bullpen role for the first time here in 2023 we let him start out a few games towards the end of that uh 2022 season um so He's, he's, again, adjusting to this reliever role, the amount of use that takes. And I think I do remember those frustrating outings towards the end where it just seemed like he may have been tired and they wanted to keep him that, hey, we've got this option right now. We're not going to pitch you as much at AAA. Just get some rest and then come back the next year. So I, I am hopeful that at least as a middle innings reliever, him and Brian Baker, I think stuff wise is pretty amazing. Like I'm happy you brought up that slider because every time I turn on Savant, I remember them saying slider velocities. And then you see, Oh, Mike Bauman's like right, right up there with, yeah. with some of the best. Um, I, I think he's definitely, again, I'll right now attribute it to it being, he got tired towards the end, but he's definitely capable of better. It's nice that we have other guys again, Yenir Cano, Danny Coulomb that came in and helped save those. And it's kind of hard sometimes to think about a season without, you know, Felix Bautista. Um, I'm happy CNL found his groove and we were able to afford the time to give, get him time to find his groove. I think Michael Bauman, I'd like to, I will, we'll certainly be paying attention to him. 
I don't think there's a short leash by any means, but we have to also consider now that he is out of options. So um, I, I think already there's immense value for a team that would see his potential. And I just do hope that it's harnessed with us uh, in, in a role. Yeah, and there's still a chance to do it. So we didn't do any predictions on Bradish because I think we both agree he's the ace moving forward. He's the guy. We love Bradish. Sure. I'll give you your gut feeling, quick reaction to this Mike Bauman prediction question before we go. Okay. Orioles enter the postseason in 2024. Is Mike Bauman on the postseason roster? As of right now, I would keep him on the uh, postseason roster. And uh, again, not knowing what will happen or transpire in the winter meetings next week and then over the season, but I, I think in terms of innings and the value he provided, it, it's nice to have someone who made those 60 appearances close to about 60, 65 innings himself, a uh, combination of both minors and, and, and the major leagues. And I, I think someone who can learn from that first year as a reliever experience uh, can, can have that moving forward. I think uh, I'm, I'm also with you when you talk about Brian Baker, for example, uh, someone who has incredible stuff plus value, and we know when he's on, he can be incredible. Both these guys are a bit soul-searching right now, trying to find that consistency, and I get it. No one can be lights out from start to finish, right? But I do think there's a future for Michael Bauman in this organization, and I do. I would absolutely put him in the playoff roster um, just because of uh, the time and the repertoire in this org. I think about the jump that he made from when the new regime came in in 2019 and saw Michael Bauman and they made him repeat high a Frederick, even though he was still pretty solid there. And for good reason, because they were able to work with him before that Bradish trade. This was the number three pitching prospect in the organization. Um, I think it's easy sometimes to dismiss Michael Bauman and not think about him too much now that he's a reliever. But I think there's another another peak that he can certainly reach with this team. Um, so, yes, he would be on my right now hypothetical 2024 uh, roster. Yeah, I think there's there's another there's another gear for him to get to. Um, there is certainly something else there, and hopefully we will see it in 2024. Vivek, thank you so much for joining us here on the pod. Let everybody know before we go kind of where they can find you, what kind of Oriole stuff you are up to. I know it's kind of your big time of the year uh, with the rule five draft approaching. Yeah, no, absolutely. You, you took the words right out of my mouth. I, <laughs> uh, you can again see my uh, Twitter handle again. I just shook. Yeah. I like researching players again on the rule five and waiver wire from time to time. I think it's an amazing exercise to try to find uh, different players that may either be overlooked, underlooked, or simply not getting the recognition that they deserve, especially with the Orioles, uh, I think have capitalized the most on the rule five draft. We currently have four different roster spots open. Who knows if we sign anyone, but it's always a fun opportunity to see if we can bring in someone. I want to see them in spring training, see what the data comes out on them. And if there's potential for them to be on this team, um, you never know when injuries will happen and you're going to need multiple guys throughout a season. So uh, many orgs do look at the rule five and I think there was a few successful picks even from the last year. So I'm hoping to post in the next few days, one of my final boards for the rule five draft. And uh, we can all listen to the audio clip on MLB.com <laughs> when the rule five draft is done because video is just too complicated. And <laughs> yeah, I think we'll be uh, <laughs> keeping our ears close for the rule five draft, or at least I will. <laughs> yeah, the production value just continues to be incredible for the Rule and 5 draft. Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's 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 It really takes you back. But that was Vivek Shukluff joining us here to talk about the seasons of Kyle Bradish and Mike Bauman. We will be back on the pod later this week. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb. And this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day.